So we've been talking about the book of Philippians, and last week we actually passed the halfway mark. We finished the first two chapters and began on chapter three. Does anybody remember what we talked about last week? We talked about the foundation that the church is built upon, the gospel. And in the beginning of chapter 3, Paul is describing how there's some trying to move in and kind of twist and tweak the gospel a little bit, which when you do that, it actually destroys the entire gospel. And so he wants to keep on track by remembering the true gospel. And he actually defined a person who is following the true gospel for us with three terms, right? He said, it's those who worship by the Spirit, who glory only in Christ Jesus, and who put no confidence in the flesh. Now, as is typical for Paul, whenever he writes, he usually gives a section of theology, and then he follows it up with some practical how-tos, like, what do you do with this now? Well, this is what you do with us. And he's done that in this chapter as well. And that's the part I want to talk about this week. And it starts at verse 12. So let me read that passage for you too. Starting at verse 12, not that I have already obtained this or am already perfect, but I press on to make it my own because Christ Jesus has made me his own. Brothers, I do not consider that I have made it my own. But one thing I do, Forgetting what lies behind and straining forward to what lies ahead, I press on toward the goal for the prize of the upward call of God in Christ Jesus. Let those of us who are mature think this way. And if in anything you think otherwise, God will reveal that also to you. Only let us hold true to what we have attained. Brothers, join in imitating me and keep your eyes on those who walk according to the example you have in us. For many of whom I have often told you, now tell you even with tears, walk as enemies of the cross of Christ. Their end is destruction, their God is their belly, their glory is in their shame, with minds set on earthly things. But our citizenship is in heaven, and from it we await a Savior, the Lord Jesus Christ, who will transform our lowly body to be like his glorious body by the power that enables him even to subject all things to himself. So that's his practical how-to. And if you look at it carefully, it actually doesn't take you long to realize there's kind of like four main points in this that he develops. And those four points are the practical how-to. This is what you do with the gospel, okay, to actually fulfill it. The four points will come up on the screen here. First of all, clarify your goal. What are you living for? Clarify your goal. Trust in God's leading as you walk this walk. Be faithful to God in what you already know about him, and also be faithful to each other. Clarify your goal, trust in God's leading, be faithful to God, and then be faithful to each other. So I'm giving you those right up front, and now I want to walk through them one point at a time. So he begins by saying, clarify your goal. Let me reread for you verses 13 and 15. Brothers, he says, I do not consider that I have made it my own, but one thing I do, here it begins, Forgetting what lies behind, straining forward to what lies ahead, I press on toward the goal, defined for you now, for the prize of the upward call of God in Christ Jesus. So clarify your goal first, which is the prize of your calling. Now that's a prize to him. We should feel it's a prize because it's a gift to us, but it's actually a prize to him. He now has you in his family, which he's thrilled about, and he has a very specific calling for you. And basically, in order to clarify that call, call there's two parts. Forgetting what is behind and straining toward what is ahead. Forgetting what is behind and straining toward what is ahead. So first of all, you have to forget what is behind. Now, what he means by that is forget whatever you were doing to think that you could make it on your own, to think that you had to do a certain lifestyle in order to be accepted by God. You have to forget all that. If you remember last week, for those of you who are here or listening online, that he listed seven things the tr but the people of Israel, born the tribe of Benjamin, a Hebrew of Hebrews, According to the law of Pharisee, he had seven things of which he was strictly observing on his own that made him feel like he was privileged. And that's what he's referring to when he's saying the words, forget all this. I have forgotten all these things that I listed out to you. It's kind of like 
you have a coat, right, that keeps you warm. And you like it. You love it. And every year, you use it. Year after year after year. And it starts to get worn, and it starts to have holes in it, and it's not as thick and fluffy as it was, and you have to pull it a little bit tighter, and it's kind of dirty, and it's starting to get ugly. And maybe it even smells a little bit. But you think this is what you need to keep you warm until someone buys you a new one. And then you take that one and you put that on and go, oh my gosh, this is fantastic. I didn't realize how cold I was in the old one, right? And you have to ditch the old one in order to get the new one. Well, that's what Jesus did. When the gospel that we put our faith in, which is his death on the cross for our sins and his resurrection, promising us a resurrection too, right? When we put our faith in that, we have to get rid of our jacket and take the one that he gives us, his coat of righteousness. So the first thing we do is forget all these things that are behind, and then we strain toward what is ahead. Now, there's a difference in the forgetting and the straining in the sense that forgetting is a one-time thing. You just have to say to yourself, you make a decision, that's it. That's not what I'm trusting anymore. But the straining toward what is ahead is something we have to practice every day. We have to keep pushing forward. We have to keep pushing after God and discipling and listening and following God in all that he tells us. And the, and the word is a strong one, dioko, to mean pushing in, pressing in. It's actually a word that's translated in many times in the New Testament as the word persecution. This word of straining toward what is ahead is also translated as persecution. So when Jesus says, blessed are those of you who are persecuted for my sake, he's using this same word. Blessed are those of you who are being pushed upon, pushed hardly, try, hardly, trying to push you out, trying to make sure you don't follow Jesus anymore. There's this hard press of persecution. In the same way, we're supposed to press in toward Jesus and press very vigorously with our lives. So just as eagerly as God grabbed us through Jesus and now counts us as his prize, so we grab on to Jesus in the same way. It's a single focus, pressing on toward this goal. You know, the people that actually become famous, that actually make their marks, always have a single focus, right? You know, if you say these names like Martin Luther King, civil rights, you think of it right off the bat, right? If you think of, uh, if you say Sir Edmund Hillary, boom, you think of Mount Everest. If you think, say Henry Ford, boom, you think of automobiles, right? It's the one thing that they were pressing for. They had a single focus, and that's all they were concentrating on. Now, I'm going to ask you a question here. How many of you know the name and know who he is if I say Dave Waddle? Dave Waddle. Anybody raise their hand for Dave Waddle? All right. I know there's two hands raised in this auditorium. The other is Bob Andrews, a friend of mine. And the reason that we know the name Dave Waddle is we're both runners. And we were serious about her running. He's still serious about his running. I'm not so serious about it. I'm just glad I can walk. But, <laughs> but Dave Waddle was a runner. And um, Bob can probably tell you the same thing to me. He knows everything about Dave, I'm sure. But he ran in the 1972 Olympics in the 800 meters for the United States. And I was tempted to actually show you that race this morning because it only lasts like a minute and three quarters. They run two laps really fast in the Olympics. So it's a two-lap race. But if you watch this guy, he takes off and he's in last place. He goes immediately to the back of the pack. And so it's only two laps, but at the end of one lap, he's in last place. At the end of a lap and a half, he's in last place, but he's way behind in last place. So he comes around that last turn. He's got like 40 meters to go, and you say to yourself, there is no way that this guy's going to win the race, right? I mean, it's impossible. As many times as I've watched this video of him, every time I go, you know, he's not going to do it this time. Right? He's just not going to, you can't do this, right? These are exceptional runners. But boy, he puts his head down and he starts churning and he passes everybody. And right at the line, he nips the guy for the gold medal. I mean, it's a spectacular race, right? Because that's the kind of person that Paul is envisioning when he writes this. He's putting this in athletic terms. He's saying, hey, look, 
You can't focus on the crowd anymore. You can't even think about your competition. You're focusing on one thing. You're focusing on that finish line and getting there first. That's all you have to do to do it right, right? But you have to focus. Yeah, I think most of you um, know that, I guess it's been a year and a half now. It's like a year and a half ago that I had brain surgery. And after brain surgery, one of the immediate results was is I totally lost my balance, right? I mean, it started with vertigo right after the surgery, but that passed quickly. But it took me a while to regain my balance so that, you know, I, I couldn't even stand up out of bed without someone helping me at first, and then that was okay. Then I was walking with a walker, and then I was walking with crutches, and then walking down the street even with ski poles on each side of me, and a ton of specific balance exercises, right? Now, if you were to watch me do these balance exercises, you may try to be really polite and not laugh at me, but it's, it's actually hysterical. I mean, some of them are absolutely, you have to laugh if you're watching me, right? One of the ones that I do is that I, I walk down the street and I had Donna follows me and she holds a ball. And we're walking down the street together. And while we're walking, I'll turn this way. And I keep walking, but I turn this way and she throws the ball to me. And then I turn this way and I throw it to her. And then she throws it back and I catch it and I turn this way. All the while I'm walking, right? So, and I'm getting better at it. But you know how I walk, right? When I'm doing that? It's not like this. It's like round, 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 round. My goal is to try to get straight, right? To try to get better and better at this. You cannot walk a straight line if you keep turning around and looking behind you. Paul says, like an athlete, you have to forget what is behind. You have to focus your head forward. And you have to charge. And it takes work, and it takes effort. You have to push as if you're persecuting this goal, right? That you want to execute this. Now, while you're doing that, there's two extremes to avoid. You can't think, first of all, that I must do it all, right? No, you still have to rely on God. Remember, the gospel is about we worship by the Spirit, we glory only Christ Jesus, we put no consonants in the flesh. We have to rely on God and his empowerment for this. But the second extreme is the other thing, is that I must, or God must do it all, right? God must do it all, which is not the case, right? We have the responsibility, which is Paul, Paul is saying, is we have to put some effort into this. And we have to continue to follow him, to seek him, ask for his empowerment, and strain toward the goal that he puts in front of us. So the first thing that Paul says on sticking with the gospel and really practicing it in your life is to clarify your goal, which is God's calling in your life in both the character that he wants you to be as well as the purpose he wants you to perform, right? And that is what you push toward. So clarify your goal. Then secondly, trust in God's leading. Let me read verse 15 for you. Verse 15 says, Let those of us who are mature think this way, and if on anything you think otherwise, God will reveal that also to you. So Paul's painting the picture of here's the way your Christ, life in Christ is supposed to be. Now follow it. And if you don't get it, if you disagree with it, God will reveal it. If you trust in his leading, God will continue to reveal these things to you. And the word reveal literally means to take the lid off. It's like a pot that's cooking. You know, if I come home and Donna has something cooking on the stove and I, as soon as I walk in, I go, oh, man, that smells great. What is that? And so I walk over and I, if I pull off the pot, then I really get a whiff and I get to see everything that's in it. God is in the business of pulling that lid off for us if we wait, if we ask him to do that. He'll continue to reveal more that he wants in our lives. Now, it's interesting how he writes this statement. If you think differently than me, God will reveal this to you. I don't, I don't think he's mad. I don't think he's saying like, well, if, if you don't agree with what I'm saying, then God's going to slap you upside the head, right? 
I think he's being very patient. He doesn't seem to be cross. He's saying, I know we're at all different levels of maturity and all different levels of following, all different levels of knowledge of the word. So we won't all get it at the same time. But just remember, God will continue to bring you along if you continue to be open for that leading. Because he's in the business of leading. He's in the business of revealing his will to us. It's spoken over and over in scripture. Matthew eleven twenty five, 25, Jesus says, I praise you, Father, Lord of heaven and earth, that you have hidden these things from the wise and intelligent, but have revealed them, same word that's used in Philippians, you have revealed them to infants, those of us who humbly accept what he gives. And even if it sounds crazy, we're willing to follow it, right? Even in the Old Testament, the Old Testament was eventually translated into Greek, which the New Testament is written in, right? It's called the Septuagint. And in Numbers, they use the same Greek word talking about the story of Balak and Balaam, right? Balak was a king who wanted to oppose Israel as they were coming into the promised land, and he hired Balaam, who was a prophet, to come and curse Israel. And God told him, don't you go to curse Israel, and Balaam got on his donkey and started to go to see Balak. And God put an angel with a sword in his way. And he didn't see it, but his donkey that he was riding saw it and refused to budge forward. And it says this on Numbers twenty two thirty one: Then the Lord opened the eyes, revealed, same word, opened the eyes of Balaam. And he saw the angel of the Lord standing in the way with a drawn sword in his hand. And he bowed all the way to the ground. God continues to reveal. And it'll eventually continue even through our lifetime. In 1 Corinthians 3.13, it says this, each man's work will become evident for the day will show it because it will be revealed in fire. And the fire itself will test the quality of each man's work. Have we been straining toward that goal? You know, if a person is really willing to know, God will reveal it. In the book of Acts, Paul wanted to go to Bithynia, but God revealed very clearly that he was supposed to not go there, but to go to Macedonia. Balaam wanted, Balak wanted Balaam to go and curse, but God revealed that Balaam was supposed to go and bless. Me, and back in the 80s when I first went to Thailand, I wanted to go to India, but God revealed that I was supposed to go to Thailand. Trust in God's Leading, He's in the business of taking the lid off the pot if we seek his will. Thirdly, be faithful to God. Be faithful to God. Again, let me go back, read verse 16. Only let us hold true to what we have already attained. Let us hold true to what we have already attained. Some of us know this much. Some of us know this much. Some of us know this much. Let's hold true to what we have attained. We all have this journey to go along, and none of us have reached the full goal. So there's all this new that we need to learn and follow and hear from the Lord. But in the meantime, what we have, don't forget it. It's like the words to an apprentice. If you're training someone in a, in a trade, like a carpentry or plumbing or something like that, it's a lot for an apprentice to learn. So you teach him along the way. But if he starts forgetting the few things you taught them, you won't take them the rest of the way. It's not worth it. You have to hold true to what you already have gained. That's what discipleship is. Be faithful to God in what he's already told you. So you can ask for new revelation. You can ask for the lid being taken off. I need to know God's will for this or that. But the expectation of new re revelation shouldn't make you less careful about following the revelation that you already have. God always reveals himself to those who have been faithful in walking in the revelations that he already has. And a lot of that is simply in God's word. That's why we encourage you to always be in God's word. There's so much of the revelation is there. Sure, we're going to learn from the Holy Spirit as well who personalizes that in specific issues and incidents in our life. But there's so much in the word of God. While I was studying for this, I read this line. He who employs what he has prepares himself for further gifts. Right? That's true. That's what the parable of the talents is all about. Right? Because God gave the owner in the, in the parable, gave the one man ten talents, one man five, one man one. Right? 
And the man who was 10 got 10 more because he was faithful. Five got five more because he was faithful. One wasn't faithful. So even the one was taken away from him, right? We must hold true to what we have already attained. I was talking to a young guy um, earlier this year who feels like he's being called into ministry. How do you know? How do you know if you're being called into the ministry? And we talked about a lot of ways that you can know for sure. But one of it, um, one of the ways is just serve faithfully where you are. Like wherever you are right now, just show that you want to be involved in God's work. Serve in whatever way you decide, right? But just be faithful to what he has already showed us, okay? And never be satisfied that that's the end. There's more to come and we continue to strain forward. Hold true to the same path, what you already attained. Now, actually, that word hold true originally meant a line of something that's all in a row, like a line of soldiers, or even walking forward in a line together where you're closely following the one ahead of you. Be faithful to God, and even the understanding of that word leads us to the next point. Not only be faithful to God, but be faithful to each other. Listen to verse 17. Brothers, join in imitating me, and keep your eyes on those who walk according to the example you have in us. So we're following God, right? But we're also following each other. Paul says, first of all, hey, follow me. He says that over and over in Scripture, right? That in 1 Corinthians 1.11, imitate me as I imitate Christ. Because we're obviously to keep our eyes on Jesus, the author and perfecter of our faith, as Scripture tells us. But we also have these examples these living examples that we can touch and hear and see, right? That we can follow them as well. So when Paul is saying, hey, follow me like I follow Christ, he's not being arrogant. He's not being cocky. But the fact is, we know a lot about Jesus, but we can't actually physically see him. These people who are struggling, what's the true gospel and what's the false gospel, they could see Paul. And they could see the life of the false teachers. Remember, this is practically how to keep true to the gospel. And they could compare the two lives. Well, who's really living for God, right? They could see Paul, and they should follow him. You know, kids always follow examples of whatever impresses them, whether it's good or bad, right? They just follow those examples that made a real impression on them. So I mentioned my granddaughter. I'm a new grandfather, five months. Skylar is around five months old. And so when I hold her and when I talk to her, when I play with her, she's, she's interested. She lets me do that. She kind of stares at me. But if I'm holding her and her mom walks in, right, huge smile comes on her face, right? And then when her dad comes in, it's hysterical because she'll be like sitting in her chair and her dad will walk up and put his face in front of hers and he'll go, bah. <laughs> he'll just do some sound like that, right? And so she responds with a smile, but then she says something. She doesn't say da-da. She doesn't say goo-goo-ga-ga. She goes, bah. <laughs> so it's funny enough coming from the father's mouth, right? It's hysterical when you see this little baby do the exact same <laughs> thing that her father has done. That's what God is asking us to do, right? To follow examples of each other. Wasn't that the call to Jesus' disciples anyway? When he first met them, what did he say to them? Hey, I'm going to make you writers of scripture. You're going to have so much knowledge, you won't believe it. Where do you see the power you got? You know what his first words were? Follow me. Follow me. That's what discipleship is. We follow. So we get to follow Jesus, but we also get to follow each other. We can be examples to each other. I might be an example to you in some area of your life, and you might be an example to me in another area of your life. One of the reasons the church is thrown together is because God wants us to be with each other so we can lean on each other, learn from each other, and follow the right examples, especially when we're struggling. Let me go back to Dave Waddle for a minute, okay? Told you about his race. But how it affected me was incredible, right? Because at that point, I'm in high school, and I'm a runner, and I'm a serious runner, and I'm doing okay. And then I watched this race in 1972, and I was like, wow. I was so overawed and impressed. This guy became my idol, right? 
He always wore a cap, a baseball cap, whenever he ran. Until that day, I never wore a cap. But after that day, I never was without a cap. <laughs> Practice, races, I always had my baseball cap, right? I had a varsity jacket. You know, you get a varsity jacket, at least you used to when you're in high school and you're running a sport. And whose name did I put on it? Yep, you guessed it. I didn't put Boyd, Hanold. I had quotation marks, Waddle. That was on my varsity jacket. I still have that varsity jacket with that name on it, right? But it also impressed how I ran. I was determined to get better and better and better and really determined to build on my speed so nobody could beat me on the last lap. I wanted to win every race on the last lap if I had a chance to do that. Now, throughout my high school and college career, that affected me. I became a lot better just because I watched him and began to imitate him. And as a matter of fact, although I lost lots of races in high school and college, 1,500s, 5,000 meters, I never lost an 800-meter race. That was, his, that was his race. That was the race he ran. High school, college, I finished completely and never lost an 800-meter race. That's how it affected me. Listen, be faithful to each other. We have these examples we can follow. Follow the right example. It can be that powerful in your life. All right, let me go back and kind of paint this whole picture for you again, a little bit of review here. This is about staying true to our foundation, staying on the gospel, and not just knowing it in your head, and not just praying one prayer, asking Jesus for forgiveness, which usually is where it starts, because he died for your sins, and he rose from the dead, and you want to follow him. But it means doing this. First of all, clarify your goal. God's calling in your life. That's about who you are. What kind of character do you want to have? What kind of character do you want to show off to those who are around you, in your family, in your friendships? But it's also about what you do, the specific ministry he's called you to. Clarify your goal and his calling in your life. Trust in his leading. He's given a lot of his leading to us already in the word of God. Stay in it. You'll find so much in the word of God. But also, seek the Spirit. We worship by the Spirit. We glory only in Christ Jesus. We put no confidence in the flesh. The Spirit will lead you. Be faithful to God. Those things that you know already, just keep doing them. Keep doing them and be faithful to them. And lastly, be faithful to each other. In other words, get involved with each other. Get in a group. Serve with a group. Just be involved in this church. Don't just attend. Be involved. You know, ultimately, there's two results. If you do this or if you don't do this, there's one of two results. And he explains that in verses 18 and following. For many of whom I have often told you and now tell you even with tears, walk as enemies of the cross of Christ. Their end is destruction. Their God is their belly. They glory in their shame with minds set on earthly things. But our citizenship is in heaven. And from it, we await a Savior, the Lord Jesus Christ, who will transform our, body, our lowly body to be like his glorious body by the power that enables him even to subject all things to himself. It's either destruction or transformation. Destruction or transformation. You ever seen those Capital One commercials with Charles Barkley and the little kids? There's a commercial where little kids are picking a basketball team and they're all little kids except for Charles Barkley, who used to be a professional basketball player. So the first pick, you know, the kid says, I'm a Barkley, right? And the whole point of the commercial is, this is the easiest call to make, right? Destruction or transformation, this is the easiest call to make. Are we really going to pursue Jesus or not? Two weeks ago, Rick Romano was here. The whole focus of his message is, what's your call? I know what my call is, he said. But what's yours? What does God want you to be? How does he want you to grow? And what does he want you to do for his kingdom? I'm going to take a moment here, just a silent prayer. Then we're going to worship together. But first, before this silent prayer, just during this silent prayer, just talk to God. 
just talk to God. Speak to him whatever's on your heart as you're hearing this message today. This is how you apply the gospel. Ultimately, you want to might want to make an appointment with the pastor to talk about this more, someone on staff. You might want to get involved with the group, talk to a friend. You might want to just serve. We'd love to have you serve, princetonalliance.org slash serve, right? You can find ways to just jump in and be part of this. But it first starts with just seeking God, right? Seek God. So let's take a moment while I sit here just to do business with our God, each one in their own seat, wherever you are. Thank you, Father, again for your word. For this book of Philippians, so much in it, Father. We're spending some time in it, but we could spend even more time in it. It's so rich in your instructions. It's so rich in the truth and knowledge of who you are and who we need to be. Thank you, Father, for what we've been looking at today. Thank you that we are your prize. And following you is our prize. And we want to. We want to follow you. We want to make sure we have a clear view of what your call on our life is. We want to make sure that we trust in your leading. We want to be faithful to you all the days of our life. And we want to be a church that's faithful to each other. So, Father, continue to minister to us, continue to direct us, both as individuals and as a body. And we praise you for it. As we worship now, bring our hearts close. Speak to us. Even as we speak to you, we pray in Jesus' name. Amen.